recording this event and we'll make it available um, on the IGHN website. Uh, we're live streaming available at the moment on YouTube on the Irish Global Health Network cha uh, channel. If you have any questions, we would love to hear them during the webinar. Please put your questions into the chat and I will do my best as the moderator to direct those questions. And we may also be able to answer some of them um, in, in the chat. And please, we encourage you to share messages from this event on Twitter and other social media platforms. Um, we're really, really very honoured and we feel that this is a very important event to make sure that we uh, that we highlight what is happening and um, the situation in Sudan and the responses that are happening. And also that we look together as a community to understand, better understand, uh, you know, what we can do and how we can support um, what's unfolding in Sudan. Um, who better than to give us an update and really, you know, ground us in the context of Sudan than, uh, than uh, Nuha. Dr. Nuha Ibrahim, lecturer and friend lecturer in public health at the University of Limerick and of course a Sudanese woman uh, living in Ireland. Nuha would you just um, help us just help ground us and bring us to the context before we uh, speak to our panelists and you're very welcome Nuha. Thank you so much Nadine and thank you so much for the Irish Global Health Network Nadine and the team for giving us this opportunity actually to share um, our unfortunately sad story about what is going on in our country so thank you so much for this opportunity we really appreciate it and hopefully in a few minutes, just a few slides, I would like to share just a quick update on what is going on in Sudan. Maybe I'll not be able to cover everything, but maybe just a quick highlight. And during the discussion, other aspect of what's going on in Sudan will be covered by my colleagues and friends from Sudan. So just let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Okay, so just a quick uh, uh, background about, about Sudan. Sudan is, is the third biggest country in Africa. It was the biggest till 2011 before the separation of South Sudan, but, uh, but it's still a huge big country with 46 million people. And in Khartoum, the capital only, officially there is 300,000 six million thousand people living in Khartoum. However, we Sudanese believe that it might be far more than that. Uh, since the independence of Sudan, 1956, Sudan go through a lot of long conflicts and this impact the political instability, economic stability and development of the country. Since the separation of South Sudan, even where most of the oil was there, it's affect the whole economic, the political kind of, um, instability in the last few years was severe. Um, the conflict in Darfur since 2003, uh, where the, the previous government, unfortunately, the Omar al-Bashir uh, created uh, this uh, group or militia to handle the conflict in, in West Darfur, which is turned out to be the rabbit uh, uh, force um, and it's just a background of that um, recent conflict in 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 April 2023. This the last few months was a bit different. The um, rabbit armed force um, support forces, which created in 2003, and to control the conflict in in West in Darfur, kind of evolved and kind of changed to be officially one of the um, hands and arms of the of the army. Until the day before uh, 15th of April, they were officially the two armies in Sudan. They were one army, but that uh, rabbit support force was officially part of it. And when we say a sudden kind of start of the com of a war, it was a real sudden. So in the morning, like this picture is really reflecting what's going on. It was this peaceful time, and in just in few hours, turn now to be the other half. People were on their way to school. People were at work, on the road, and suddenly things kind of become so much tragic. And we have this a real war between two armies in the middle of Khartoum. This turned out to be any kind of basic uh, act like sleeping in your bed become very dangerous where suddenly a bullet will come from somewhere, a wall could fall on you because of this shooting of the two armies. Going to the kitchen to prepare a cup of coffee was 
the most dangerous act for one of the very few uh, girls who killed because through the windows in the kitchen, a bullet come from nowhere, killed that girl. So suddenly out of nowhere, all Khartoum become unsafe and everyone is could lose their lives for anywhere and at any time. And this conflict between the two leaders, the leader of the uh, Sudanese uh, armed forces or the rapid support forces, each side blamed the others of starting this conflict. And each one of them, they have the people who support this theory or that. Maybe there is disagreement on how it is taught, but everyone will agree on how it is impact the situation now in Sudan, where more uh, 4 million people displaced inside Khartoum and 71% of those displaced people are from Khartoum inside Sudan. We, the situation before this war, it wasn't ideal and there was a huge displaced uh, people in Darfur and different regions in Sudan, but this take it to another level. The UNICEF said one in two children are in need for humanitarian aid and seven million are out of children and out of school. Between the, and, and even getting, reaching those people, helping them um, cure, it was, it is not like the usual war where you could have a, a safe corridor. The humanitarian situation even worse with violation of human rights, rape cases, and there is so much psychological traumas, not only for children, but for adults who flee their homes, just suddenly leaving everything, their money, their papers, their passport, going to nowhere. And this was kind of creating traumas, not only for people who leave it, but people who, the children who leave those, the adult, the old people, and they go through journeys, it wasn't, easy at all to flee outside the country. So what, what is different with this time, with this conflict in, in Khartoum? You know, we know there is kind of similar uh, genocide and conflict in Darfur, in, in South Sudan. But uh, in this uh, time, this, this is a capital where it was really all the official kind of uh, uh, ministries, all the, and unfortunately there is a huge, inequality in distribution of resources, of services. So that's why it's uh, impact people kind of uh, and system all over the country. The media um, kind of the way how it's used, the, the two armies, the two people use it in a way that unfortunately in this, in this war, it's very hard to tell the truth where each one of them had their version of reality making everyone confused what is going on and when is this going to stop and how is it going to happen. Destruction of everything. Everything is, is kind of uh, everyone um, and everything is could be a target for, 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 for this kind of uh, war between the two sides. And there is no way to have a safe corridor for humanitarian workers to, to kind of save people or help people inside inside Khartoum. In, um, when you say no safe corridors really, and this is a quote from the MSF, when, and we are glad we have colleagues here from MSF today, the experience of this is kind of beyond the, the, what they, they could imagine or what is acceptable. After routing one of our medical warehouse in Khartoum fridge were unplugged and medicine removed, the entire cold chain uh, was ruined so that medicines are spoiled and cannot be used to treat anyone. And this looting was a, another uh, layer of catastrophic impact of this war. All houses, all cars, all kind of uh, banks, uh, hospitals, everything was a um, target for this war. Uh, the health system in Sudan, and we talk about already fr a fragile system before the war, so 67% of Sudan hospitals are out of service. And even those who are currently working, they, they don't work with full capacity. They have problems with access to uh, resources, enough uh, workers to work, um, health workers under, under attack. The hospitals are working with, with, uh, under huge pressure. Those in another cities where, for example, in, in, in Madani, where we have less than half a million people living there, 
now they have 4 million living there. And I say those numbers with cautions because there is uh, this change in numbers and that every day you have more catastrophic statistics. And even this one, you, you said this WHO, July, and this is uh, UN, August, every time you have different statistics. So it's even hard to follow and and, and be sure what is the most up-to-date, but the, the real kind of fact, the only fact that those hospitals or health services outside Khartoum, dealing with this huge displayed amount of people are not ready to cope with that workload. They don't have the facilities, they don't have the health workers, they don't have the resources to cope uh, with, with, with all this need. The, the, the hospitals in Sudan are really um, under attack. And this is for these photos are from one of the pediatric surgery uh, kind of uh, rooms in, in, in one of the hospitals in Khartoum. And again, just to remind you again and again, it wasn't the best before the war. So now even worse. The amount of people displaced and the humanitarian access and support is limited and the outbreak of malaria and, and other diseases. And uh, it's really kind of uh, alarming and all organizations, international organizations, WHO alarm, raise kind of uh, concerns about the situation in Sudan. And it was really frustrating because they cannot do anything because of the two armies engaged in negotiations and agree on ceasefire, but it wasn't a true ceasefire where the international organization could work to provide support or treat people or even evacuate those who are in need to evacuation. Those who just flee outside their homes and countries, they didn't go through a smooth journey for those who go outside Khartoum. The checkpoints in the borders between um, Sudan and Egypt or Sudan and Ethiopia or Sudan and Chad, all these kind of have limited access to adequate services. We have so many cases of people just fall and die while they're waiting for their papers in, in, the, in the checkpoint while they're going to Egypt. So many people dying just uh, from heart attack or from pain or from uh, just diabetes, um, diabetic, um, they need basic services. and. Anyway, so it was really um, traumatic for so many people. And when we say people fleeing to Ethiopia and Egypt and different countries, sometimes the same family is split it on those countries. So the father go to a country, the children go to another country. And even now having them all in one country become a real challenge for some of them, which is really add to the tragedy. So yeah, those are people in Port Sudan waiting to cross the sea to another places. Those are in Egypt and those are in Chad waiting to cross the borders to Chad and another waiting to cross the borders to Ethiopia. Unfortunately, the situation is really um, kind of catastrophic and the, the pain and the impact uh, of this on children, on women, on all people, on the health service is really really kind of not uh, acceptable, but um, there is, there was a negotiation between the two arms facilitated by the US and the Saudi Arabia to ceasefire, but I don't think so far anything of this work, hopefully, maybe in the next few days, we hear something more positive. I was hoping to end my presentation with something more uh, positive about a hope or something, but we are really, as a Sudanese, we are really traumatized from what is going on. And we really hope something will happen. And a day will come when we start talking about the good things in our countries and the happy moments and the happy future and the cultures and the food and the things that we're really proud of. And uh, till then, uh, we just uh, continue praying for a better future. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Nua. Thank you so much for um, just sharing with us in the way that you did um, the situation and just 
Yeah, just how sobering that situation is, the reality of for 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 people's lives, for families. And I know we're 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 also talking about your families, the families of of those of you who are are speaking here today, and um, all of you are 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 affected. Um, so we're really grateful for you sharing this with us because I think our it's really important that we all as as a community and and as 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 the world understand this situation. So that if we're able to respond, that we can. Um, so, Noah, thank you for that. It was um, it was really, really. I learned a lot. Thank you for that. Um, I think uh, what we will do is um, we'll move to the panel um, and just engage our, our panel members in some conversations and. You know, we have a, a really, really interesting panel here. So I'm joined today by six panel members. We have um, Kira Norton, who is the program manager with the HSC Global Health Program. Kira, you're welcome. We have Dr. Yasir Hamad, who is the president of the Sudanese Doctors' Union of Ireland. We have Sandra Beatty, who is the area health and nutrition coordinator for North Darfur for Goal. We are also joined by Dr. Aya Mohammed, who is a microbiology lecturer, a registrar in Trinity College Dublin, and and also a Sudanese national who's been who, who's been raised in in Ireland and has a, an active interest in the evacuation process and and ongoing humanitarian issues. Um, you're very welcome, Dr. Aya. Um, also joined by Georgina Brown, um, who's medical coordinator with MSF, Medicine Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders. Um, and then last but not least, um, joined by Dr. Elsa Dig Abdel Noor, who's consultant in acute medicine in University Hospital Waterford, uh, president of the Sudanese Doctors in Ireland. Um, so you're all very, very welcome to the panel and uh, we're very grateful for your time and for your sharing uh, in advance for your sharing of your experience. Um, Dr. Yasser, I might start with uh, with yourself um, and just to say, I mean, we've just heard and, and you will know this situation um, very well, but we've just heard from Nuha, you know, that 67 percent of the hospitals are out of service, that, um, you know, medicines are, are, you know, medicines that have been in warehouses are, 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 are being wasted and not being used, that the health service is under huge stress. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, there's a huge diaspora in Ireland of Sudanese doctors and medical professionals of which all of us in Ireland benefit hugely in our own healthcare. Um, what is the role and, and you know, what is the perspective of the doctors who are based here in Ireland? And um, you know, what's the role of the Sudanese Doctors Union to respond to this crisis? Well, thank you, uh, Nadine, and thanks, uh, Noha, for the uh, very good presentation of the situation in Sudan. Thanks, Kira, and thanks, Messi, for organizing all this. Uh, webinar um, as an uh, Sudanese Doctors Union of Ireland, we got engaged from the first day. We were very clearly uh, against this war, and as a diaspora doctors uh, unions from Canada, America, Ireland, UK, uh, Qatar, uh, Australia, New Zealand, along with the uh, prelimin preliminary committee of the Sudan's Doctors Union in Sudan, we sent an article on the day of 16th of April next day and night to the, to the UN and the Security Council condemning um, this a SAF and RSF a conflict and uh, urging the international community uh, to exert pressure and try to stop this war immediately and immediately inspire and provide humanitarian uh, aid to uh, affected civilians. And um, that's uh, an immediate action and then we went into a locally here in Ireland to a protest against this war and um, calling for this war to a end immediately and calling for the Irish government and through EU to help and politically, diplomatically, as well as from the humanitarian aid a perspective as well. Um, we continued uh, our efforts uh, from the humanitarian aid as we shared this with the other unions, especially in Sudan. Um, immediately, the first week we sent 3,000 euros. Uh, that's for logistics because uh, after that, I, I, the, the war broke suddenly. Um, there, the, the hospitals were out of a electricity, a shortage of everything. And so the uh, union in Sudan took the, a, 
active part and, 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 and to run those hospitals because of the rush of injured people, the rush of acute emergencies as well. And then we continued as well to support a, a hospitals outside uh, Khartoum, uh, mainly in Medellin, uh, supporting the psychological rehab for a trauma and healing for children in Medellin. That's the central part of Sudan, uh, $7,400. And then a Lubay teaching hospital, West Sudan, for an acute a consumable and uh, urgent medical uh, uh, needs uh, for $8,000. And then we um, established a health center for displaced people in Akbar, which again in the North Sudan, uh, for a $11,300 um getting that uh, medical center with consumables and and, and equipment and a uh, full laboratory uh, and that was shared between us and the a sdu uk uh, and then we went into uh, having our logistics center in port leash with uh, a lot of equipment and medical supplies including walking aids and and uh, wheelchairs more than 100 nebulizers more than 80 um, couches and, and, and oxygen concentrators, uh, wall uh, monitors, as well as a full a storm back. And that was shipped uh, end of June to Sudan and it did reach the Port Sudan, uh, Port Sudan in uh, 10 days ago and the uh, donation office uh, in uh, uh, Federal Ministry of Health uh, is following on that to receive it and distribute it to the area needed. Um, we are actively, as uh, Kira and myself and Nuha, uh, we had a look at a, some um, donation here from the Irish, uh, uh, former Irish, a, uh, sadly, uh, businessman who sadly died. And, and uh, we had uh, uh, sterile goals and, um, and medical supplies uh, that's worth 80,000 euros. And we're in the process of uh, shipping those as well, along with the HAC uh, donations, which we did apply and, uh, you know, asking for help uh, for the Sudanese uh, community and civilians. Um, I just would like to point out to one thing, Kira Norton and Professor David Ruklium were with us in Khartoum mid a uh, February and we had a very successful uh, conference uh, SAS for Sims and on the final remarks of this and me and a uh, David Wickley and we just um, pointed to the importance of the collaboration between the HEC and the uh, Ministry of Health of Sudan Sudanese doctors to continue that journey of 50 years uh, more than 1,200 uh, Sudanese doctors registered in Irish Medical Council. And if we add the second generation and uh, the doctors who have been graduated from European countries and different parts and who are Irish, one of them is Aya, and we're more than 1,500 Sudanese doctors. And that collaboration now has changed, unfortunately, after the 15th of April. And rather than education and health, which again, we needed that. We needed that to continue for the health service outside uh, Khartoum, outside there for. For that collaboration needed now to go into the humanitarian aid part, which Ireland is very known history-wise in supporting all the civilians around the world in charity work and I think we needed more. We needed more from the, our friends and the Irish community and the Irish charity, the Irish aid, the Irish government, um, because those civilians were caught in this. They were innocent. The two groups have arms and the two groups supported, uh, supposedly supposed uh, to protect civilians rather than uh, causing all this. So this is brief, and uh, now we're in the process of shipping um, two containers, hopefully. The cost of each is 9,000. The last one we paid at the 9,000, it's all around 
because of it's all because of the our members uh, thanking all the SDOI members thanking all Sudanese who um, contributed to this and uh, the Beacon Hospital uh, as well uh, they supported uh, us with 5,000 uh, euros the fundraise from Tullamour Hospital cycled to Sudan more than 4,000 euros but uh, we were very limited with the uh, regulations of the bank here and you know having huge uh, money coming to our account and transactions unfortunately this is a U.S. sanctions and we're very unhappy with it and it's affecting our charity work of our humanitarian aid or health uh, you know support in this difficult time in Sudan so um I'll let someone talk uh, if or if you have any mm. questions and I will answer them mm. thank you thank you Dr Yasir um yeah what incredible work all of you have been um have been doing and and as you said you know we're, we're doing before and are doing now um just to to be able to support and what the, the needs are are so so great um as you as you mentioned the the HSC Kira I might come over to you and uh, Dr Nasser Dr Yasser mentioned that you had yourself were in Sudan in February um with uh with with David Weekly and, and you know the HSC um has a collaboration with the Ministry of Health in Sudan that that an, a memorandum of understanding about um you know the two countries in collaboration um how has that been affected um and I guess what what can and 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 is the HSC doing to continue um supporting Sudan um probably more as a humanitarian response at the moment Thanks, Nadine, and uh, thanks to Nuha um, and Yasser um, for really giving us a, 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 the insight into to what's happening in Sudan. And it's really shocking and heartbreaking to see the sudden devastation. Um, so recently, since our visit um, between David and myself uh, to Sudan in February and March, and as Yasser said, we attended a wonderful conference um, attended by the diaspora um, and the sense of hope and leadership um, at that was really touching, um, particularly more so now that that's what ha has happened since. Um, but I think it's that leadership and that connectedness with the diaspora that has really um, contributed to the role that the HSE can play in terms of uh, supporting Sudan at this moment. And just a bit of history, we have... Um, an MLU with the Ministry of Health uh, in Sudan, and that's been alive since 2017. It really formalised, I suppose, a lot of partnerships and arrangements that were in place up to then, but it has allowed us to work towards the common goals of improving quality and safety of healthcare in Sudan, building up capacity in healthcare, education, training and research, strengthening the medical nursing midwifery and professional education and training, um, and you know the involvement then of the Sudanese medical diaspora, um, all towards strengthening the, the Sudanese health system. That's been a really strong and, and great relationship. And over the last six years, we have developed the training program for medical postgraduate trainees in Ireland from Sudan. Um, a number of initiatives, partnerships have taken place to improve education for nursing, prove, improve quality and safety in healthcare. But unfortunately, we've had to take a break on some of those, given the, the sudden and immediate emergency that's arising from Sudan. Um, while we still keep those on the table and we work with them how we can, we've certainly been able to, because it's, a, it's such a great partnership, we work very closely with all our partners. We've been able to meet with our partners here in Ireland and Nuha and SMSB and Yasser have been key to that to look at how we can best now respond from a HSE perspective in terms of the humanitarian crisis that's emerging. Um, so in, in both cases, we've uh, looked at how we continue the training, which from a medium and long-term perspective for the healthcare services in Sudan still stands as a very important need to be addressed. And also we oh, more immediately we're looking at now how we can look refocus and look at our support in terms of the humanitarian crisis. Um, so I can tell you a little bit about how we've, we've done that to date in terms of the donations. The HSE um, 
is a significant source of decommissioned equipment um, and surplus supplies that can be donated to other countries. And Sudan, from our discussions and it being an important partner of ours, we have looked at Sudan to be a priority area for donations. We, we don't have an immediate response to an emergency, and I know that, that the Department of Foreign Affairs have, have responded in an immediate fashion. We would work closely with Nuha and Yasser and colleagues to look at, as our commission, their equipment becomes available, that we build up our stocks and supplies and store them centrally for uh, export then to Sudan as soon as possible. And with our partners, we can look at their needs. We we'll engage via them to, with the Ministry of Health to ensure that we are looking at meeting the needs appropriately. The Ministry of Health, that the Ministry and, and the Health Service can absorb those items over there that they're suitable for use uh, and that we have a transporter in place to ensure so that we have end-to-end -end medical donations happening that can be used immediately in Sudan and meet their current needs. Um, so as Yasser said, a, a, a shipment has arrived already and we will work both with Nuha and with Yasser to uh, get two further shipments out, we would hope, this year. And as equipment arises, then we can build on that. Um, and unfortunately, I, I think with such destruction of hospitals, there's such a huge need there. Um, we would hope that the conflict will come to at the end soon, but there will still we will still need to look at the, the humanitarian support that, that we can give to Sudan. And I'd like to thank uh, all the efforts that Nuha and Yasser have made in terms of sourcing, transport, et cetera. In addition, our own colleagues in all the hospitals in Ireland have really come on board to, to look at prioritising donations. Thank you, Kira. Um, yeah, just just really good to hear how how we're responding, what we can do, and also how we can be prepared when um, when when you know hopefully that conflict comes to an end, we can be prepared. I wonder, Nua, if you could say something. If you've been in, involved in organising the transport, I mean, you mentioned that the hospitals, you know, they've been so decimated. It must be very difficult, even those logistics of of getting that equipment, for instance, to somewhere safe, if 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 that even exists. Um, how 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 has that been trying to organize that yeah i think uh, maybe for this question yeah dr yasser probably will be because he already in contact with the one that arrived we the one that we are planning hopefully to work with in the next few days with the uh, minister of health they will be working with partners to to distribute it in the safe uh, states as much as possible it's not easy but um it is doable it's still access Khartoum state is limited and there is uh, this ongoing conflict and therefore will be a real challenge of reaching this um, the, this equipment to the to different places. So I think the strategy that the Ministry of Health and the partners in Sudan, they are going to distribute in the safe states like Medani, White Nile states, where there is a relative uh, safe place and there is a huge need because of displaced um, the number of displaced people in those areas but um, yeah it, it it takes time and there is definitely need but definitely a great help from the HSC and this is really appreciating and maybe just before we believe uh, the answer to uh, to add uh, to this uh, point for, for from the experience of the shipping of the equipment but uh, I would like really to emphasize on the thanking of what Kira said you know this is something really appreciating from our side for all those people engaged in this process from the hospitals, from the HSE, from the global health department. Thank you so much for that, really appreciating. Thank you. Thank you, Noah. Um, Dr. Yasser, would you like to add a, a brief point to that? Yeah, I mean, I think Noah is, uh, is right, you know, that the difficulty in um, transport of, of, of all these medical supplies across the country uh, is not easy. Uh, um, if we say that nine out of 18 states that directly affected by war and it's difficult to get into, especially a uh, center of uh, Khartoum, and Darfur is even worse to get into Darfur because um, all these supplies has to go through Kurdufan, um, and which is unstable itself. And, and, and they, it's always needed some kind of uh, armed convoy to get, to, go, to get all these medical supplies. And we had a meeting with the Minister of uh, Health in Sudan uh, to, you know, make more efforts. And he is 
uh, dealing with that with the uh, security in Sudan and different armed groups and to have some kind of agreement in having some mm -hmm. safe corridors, uh, but it's still very difficult. The, the right. worst area being affected is therefore five states there and right. border uh, to, chat, to chat, uh, that is really in a, in a very uh, yeah. uh, bad situation. Um, yeah. And it's just calling now for all the NGOs to give, and uh, I know that the Irish uh, aid is yeah. involved in, 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 in some yeah. uh, work there. Yeah. But that's an area needed, uh, really. Absolutely. Even the shelters, their mm -hmm. mm -hmm. care is very, very limited in, in mm -hmm. these areas. Um, uh, yeah. So the, the main thing for us, shipping any medical supplies or any donations to Sudan, um, we uh, we are in direct contact with the donation office, uh, Federal Minister of Health, and the, there are the consignee, they are supposed to distribute all these where needed and yeah. give us a final uh, destination report. And that's a very important thing. And we uh, right. stress on that point with the um, Minister of Health. Thank you, Dr. Yasser. And um, thank you for that. Um, and I just to say, we are seeing the questions coming in. Please keep the questions coming. We will direct them as we can, as we go through the webinar. Your questions are really important. Your comments are really important. And just to say, we also noticing where people are coming from. And, you know, we have we have people there from, from Morocco, from Germany, from Egypt, from Kerry, and a particular um, warm welcome to Dr. Hiba from Port Sudan, who's, um, who's joining us for this webinar. Um, and uh, hope you can feel the solid solidarity um, from, from, from the people here. Um, maybe let me move to Sandra. We were talking about the Irish uh, response and the Irish NGOs. Um, you know, goal, of course, um, on the on the ground, um, you know, in in different places in, in Sudan. And Sandra, I know yourself and your family were evacuated um, at the end of April, uh, you know, the two weeks into the conflict, you were evacuated. So, I mean, maybe we could hear just a little bit. We hear that from Nuha, you know, the corridor is, um, that there's no safe corridor. What does this mean? What What's happening in the conflict in terms of protection, protection for humanitarian aid workers in Sudan? What's happening and what do we need? Um, so thank you very much, uh, Nadine, for your question, and um, thanks to all the panelists and the presentations. Um, I think it's very important to note how how bad the conflict is in Sudan. It's it's actually really terrible. Um, sorry, I'm a bit emotional. No, um, no it's um, you're just you're you're expressing what all of us are feeling, Sandra. Thank yeah, you. yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I mean, I mean. In terms of goal, goal has been working in Sudan since 1985, and now we're working in two states, North Darfur and South Kordofan, where we support primary healthcare facilities who provide nutrition, wash services, and now looking at cash distribution for those newly displaced IDPs. Um, in terms of protection of humanitarian workers, I mean, myself and other international colleagues were evacuated quite early on into the conflict. But we have all uh, the Gold National staff who are currently still um, running our programmes in both North Darfur and South Kordofan. And I mean, as I think Dr. Yasir pointed out and Dr. Nuha pointed out, there really is um, no consideration between the two parties to the war for for civilian life or humanitarian workers, even for health workers in health facilities. I mean, there's been uh, WHO have reported 53 direct attacks on health facilities with um, people, approximately 11 people being killed and 38 injured. And that's probably only you know the right. the the reports so um i mean there has to be uh, like a some sort of a recognition between the two parties to the war that uh humanitarian corridors have to be opened up to allow humanitarian workers and the relief they can bring to to do so safely and with you know protection and um yeah just um to try and uh, reach the people in need. I mean, access, as both Dr. Nuha and Dr. Yasir have said, is um, 
is so difficult. I mean, for example, in North Darfur, we're trying to get medical supplies in. They're stuck in Port Sudan. They're stuck in El Obeid. Uh, you know, escorted services are required to get them safely. I mean, WFP have had vital uh, food supplies looted from El Obeid. Their warehouse was looted. And this was only at the beginning of the conflict. So now, you know, supplies are dwindling and and as the conflict goes on, people are more and more running out of, of vital supplies. Um, for example, in North Darfur, um, the State Ministry of Health, their staff haven't been paid since the beginning of the conflict. They're working tirelessly without salaries in extremely difficult situations. No electricity, uh, fuel is limited so they're working on generators supplies can't get through uh, you know just the conditions are so difficult and I think also I mean it, it's just I mean we don't really know the extent of the, the the situation because we can't people can't get access I mean Khartoum is so inaccessible um at the moment and it, it's just yeah, it's it's very difficult. I mean, I'm I'm sitting here at home in Ireland, so to speak. I mean, El Fasher is my home, but uh, you know, I'm safe. Whereas we have uh, workers. I'm sure the other agencies, MSF, they all have workers working on the ground in very difficult situations, trying to provide assistance. And they themselves are affected by the conflict. Goal has staff from. Khartoum that worked in Khartoum and in Kutum that have been displaced throughout throughout Sudan to White Nile, Medani, Gadaraf. Um, so yeah, it's extremely challenging, and and uh, protection is is a real concern. Yeah, yeah. Sandra, you've just you know together with Nuhan, Dr. Yasser, just you know painted such a um, a real picture and um you know just it just really touches our our hearts the, the the picture that you're you're painting there and I'm just thinking back to how Nua also presented you know how of course in this kind of a situation um you know malaria there's there's outbreaks of malaria there's measles dengue fever and um, nutrition you know we're talking about medical supplies but also food you know just the same channels that are used to deliver medicines are also used to deliver food I mean, these are the areas of, of that goal excels in, um, particularly in humanitarian crisis. And, um, you know, thanks to goal and all of the organizations like MSF who do that. How has um, how is goal able to respond to these to these particular challenges? So um, I think what um, Dr. Nuha was saying, I mean, the health system, the infrastructure in Sudan was already fragile. And so. Um, you know, goal is responding. Um, we're still supporting our 17 primary health care facilities in, in North Darfur, uh, along with 10 that have been transitioned to State Ministry of Health under a health system strengthening project. And we're also supporting a further 27 in South Kordofan. And yes, we are you know, it's extremely difficult, but Goal are sending nutrition supplies for outpatient therapeutic therapeutic feeding programs. Um, we're looking to adapt our programs and our donors, Irish Aid, Echo BHA, ACHA have been very flexible in allowing us to adapt our activities so that we can respond to the more immediate needs. So like you have so many newly displaced people on top of displaced people since the previous conflict who are in need of assistance and um you know they need as dr yasir pointed out um in medany i think he mentioned how the population has just swelled and there's huge pressure on the health services so we're trying to to adapt and and look at where you know idps have moved to and where we can provide additional support as well as the support we're also providing in in the localities where we're operational and we're also looking at cash distribution 
that that methodology to try and support people who've been displaced so that they can meet their basic needs. Yeah. Yeah, incredibly, uh, just incredibly challenging. Um, I see in, in the chat, um, we have Fiona Quinn, Deputy Director, Humanitarian Unit in Irish Aid. She's, she's also uh, attending the webinar. And, you know, you mentioned the support from Irish Aid. Irish Aid has allocated 8.5 million in humanitarian funding to Irish NGOs um, and the UN, um, the OCHA. Sudan Humanitarian Fund so far this year and um, also see that you know still the concern about breaches of international humanitarian law and the challenges in getting aid to people are are, are huge and um, so just seeing that Brita also your your comment or just um, looking for everyone who's many many people here who have lived in, and worked in Sudan and still have colleagues and friends just a shout out to Dr Al, Al Sadiqu who, who may be listening as well um, I may move, Sandra, I may move to uh, Dr. Aya um, uh, for, for just a perspective from you. I heard Dr. Yasser mentioning, you know, it's like the new generation of 1,200 Sudanese doctors in Ireland. And if we count the new generation, such as yourselves, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Elsa Dig, and we lost your video uh, there just for a second. Um, if we count yourselves, there you are. Um, it, it expands to 1,500 um, doctors um, here in Ireland. So as a Sudanese national who, I, I guess, born and raised in, in Ireland, you know, what's your perspective on the situation? And I know you've been particularly interested in the evacuation process um, so tell us a little bit about that you're welcome thank you for having me thank you for having this this, this conference i really appreciate this platform um, it is i mean i just even just seeing how emotional sandra is there it is that is literally just how i think all sudanese people and all people who love sudan feel it is just traumatic to be a sudanese person right now you literally just walk around trying to get through your day on the brink of just at the brink of tears at any stage i've called my phone and sent you like an atomic bomb you're just waiting to hear news that somebody has passed away that a missile has run through your you know your family's neighborhood or it's just a really 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 hard time to be sudanese at the moment um and as somebody who is a second generation sudanese person i didn't even realize how much i love sudan until all this happened like it just really brings it all um all kind of all home um I was by accident, I happened to be involved in the evacuation. My father was there. He was probably evacuated at the same time as um, Sandra. And there were some really, really amazing stories that came from the evacuation. And there were some real moments of humanity and of clarity that came from the Irish embassy and came from Ireland that weren't happening anywhere else. There were people that were evacuated, people that were given visas on the spot, um, things like that that the Americans weren't doing, the English weren't doing, nobody else was doing well. With us. And I don't think it's a coincidence that there's this many Sudanese people in Ireland um, beyond just doctors. I think that there's probably a shared sense of community, a shared idea with regards to family. I don't think it's, it's a coincidence that this many people from this country have decided to come and settle in Ireland. Um, and while I completely, I mean, all the amazing work that's happening with regards to, uh, you know, all the stuff that's been talked about here and um, all, all the humanitarian stuff and where kind of we are. I'm, I'm, I'm an Irish Sydney doctor. I worked, I work in the HSC. My father is also a doctor. He's worked in Ireland for over 30 years. Um, so I've seen all of these doctors come in and I've seen kind of the transition of where Ireland was and where it is now. And I think that we can have two ideas at the same time. We can be grateful and we can understand and, and be really proud of all the contributions and stuff that Ireland is doing to Sudan. And we can also be critical. And there's certain things that I think are important. And as an Irish Sudanese doctor working in the HSC, I have to say there have been some things that have just been happening on the ground that I've been really, really kind of upset about, to be honest. Um, I thought that, first of all, we had a large number of doctors who happened to be in Sudan at the time when all this happened. It was Ramadan. People tend to go there similar to Christmas time, spend time with family. So we had a large number of doctors who happened to be there um, and needed to be evacuated back. Some of them were citizens, some of them were residents. And I just, for me, I feel like we have an institution called the HSC. It has, Sudanese doctors actually make up 5% of the workforce of the HSC. I looked up the Medical Workforce Intelligence Report. Um, that is the third largest number of doctors in Ireland. So it's Irish doctors, Pakistani doctors, and Sudanese doctors. 
So we have a workforce there that is 5%, that is essentially the backbone of the HSE. There is not a hospital in this country that does not have a Sudanese doctor. There are some hospitals that I'm pretty sure if Sudanese doctors just stopped working would cease to open and multiple ones of them. And we have people coming back from Sudan. The only contact I received from a HR department during this entire time was to ask me to cover a shift for a colleague of mine who was stuck in the war zone. That was the only contact. And I have friends of mine who work in the NHS who were getting contacted by their HR departments to see if they were okay, to offer them stress leave, to offer them sick leave. Um, I still haven't had any other contact, number one. Number two, some people who were, came who came back were, actually, I have a friend of mine who went back to work. She literally was evacuated, came back to Ireland on the Sunday and was doing nights on the Monday. There were people who were asked to pay because to pay for their unpaid leave because they happened to be stuck in a war zone. That doesn't add up with what I believe, what we say that we are, which is that we're inclusive, that we're diverse. These are people who are here. They are very important members of society. They play a really, really important role. They offer a service where no one else was. And for that to be their experience of Ireland and of the HSC is, is, is really disappointing. Um, the Sudanese diaspora, while obviously NGOs are hugely important and play a massive role, the Sudanese diaspora is the biggest NGO. We are the ones who are funding these evacuations. We're the ones paying for our families. We're the ones renting these apartments. If you are lucky right now, you have spent most of your savings, if not all of your savings, trying to get your family somewhere safe, whether it be Egypt, whether it be Ethiopia, wherever it might be. Uh, and once your family get there, you are the person who is paying for that. So it is the amount of emotional strain, the amount of financial strain, the amount of just general trauma that is happening right now as a Sudanese person is something that I've, I've never experienced. Anything like it. And I'm someone who comes from a really high place of privilege. My nuclear family are here. Um, I'm just talking about my aunts and uncles and cousins. I don't know how people who have parents and sisters and, you know, I don't know how they go to work. And I know people who I know somebody right now whose two year old niece was killed by a missile during the weekend who was at work in the HSE. Like, this is the kind of stuff that we're seeing on a, on a daily basis that we're trying to that we're trying to just get through. And our role is really, really important because once Sudan does hopefully get back on its feet or in order for it to get back on its feet, it's going to be the Sudanese diaspora who are going to fund that and who are going to make that happen. Um, so I would really like more engagement from HSE. I would really, I think that if I was the head of an organization and 5% of the organization were from a country that's being ravaged by a war, I would make it my point to have a HSE Sudan point person that can actually sit there and be really if and just kind of the situation is ongoing and it's changing um I think that would be something useful I would love there was a um the week that the Afghani evacuation happened there was an, an Afghan admission program that was announced by the by the Department of Justice it's essentially a visa program so it's a way that you can apply it extends out um people that you can apply for it is a means tested program just to allow you to bring people over here it's five months in, almost four and a half, five months in, nothing like that has been announced or even talked about. I think the HSE could take an active part in lobbying for that. There are tangible things that can be done. I would love an email sent out saying it is day 35 and there is still a war in Sudan. If you, you know, if you know a Sudanese doctor, please ask and see how they are. It might remind a consultant just to check up on their SHO, to check up on their registrar and see how they're going. Even that would make a difference for me. It's really small. We're literally talking about emails um, and things that can be done. And the fact that these things are so simple and can be done and aren't being done and aren't being looked at, it says a lot. Like the silence is, is, is really, really loud. So I think that we're now at a different stage than we were earlier. We are day 138 of this war. It doesn't look like it's gonna end anytime soon. So I think we need to start talking about the people, not just the people in Sudan, but the people outside of Sudan who are you know, funding these things, making these things happen and are really traumatized in their own way, terrified for their families, terrified for their friends and still have to keep going. They have to keep going. We have to go to work every day. We have to do all these things because we are the backbones of our family. So if we don't do this, no one else is going to do this. And I don't think that's being 
dis discussed at all. I don't think it takes a lot of effort, and I would really, really like a more responsive attitude from the H, you know, from from the HSC and from all organizations, and let the HSC lead. There's the news engineers. There's the news. There's a lot of companies. Maybe if they saw statements from the HSC, that might inspire them to to do something different and to actually advocate on behalf of their employees. Um, but right now, it's it's just crickets. And to be honest, it's it's not it's not good enough. It's not good enough for a community that has provided um, and, and really, you know, provided well for Ireland and considers that. I mean, I consider myself as Irish as I do Sydney's. Um, and like I said, I've, I think I can speak to that experience, you know, really well. Um, it's, it's really disappointing. On a one-on-one -on -one level, there's nowhere like Ireland. I mean, people will ask about you, they will text you, they will care about you in a way that no one else will. But on an organizational level, it's not translating at all. And we have to do better. We really do. Thank you, Dr. Aya. That is just so clear and so powerful and such clear calls to action. Um, while you're speaking, I hope that many people are tweeting the messages that you're speaking and tagging the organizations you're speaking about, the HSC, Irish Aid. I see that, um, you know, in the chat there, um, you know, no more silence on day 138 of this of this war. Um, our DFA, our Department of Foreign Affairs, needs to speak out more. HSC needs to speak out more. Um, Kira, I might just come back to you and just say, you know, some of the things Aya is suggesting um you know in terms of emails or just just uh, raising awareness within the hsc is that something that, that that you are already maybe thinking or could even collaborate with with dr aya on just to raise awareness and see if some of these things mm -hmm. very practical things could happen yeah uh, thank you aya i'm really touched by by what you said um and i'm really disappointed that there hasn't been better communication around this we did get some feedback at the beginning that people were being communicated with about supports from the Employee Assistance Programme, but that could be in small pockets here and there where people have reached out or where people actually know that there are supports. So I am mean, certainly in favour of, of what you said, because I think that the empathy is huge. We get it everywhere we go in the HSE. People want to help. And I think it's just making that formal. And I really would value... Uh, I as input into that and I think working with NUHA as well I think we can come up with, with a way of you know getting that regularized in the HSD and getting that message out we are there you know we're, we're an organization of people and we need to to look at supporting our people our service can't support health services in Ireland or anywhere else until we are good to the people that work with us so thank you I uh, and um, I think we'll, we'll take this further for sure I'll, I'll be talking if I can communicate with you after and um, take on board also the comments from here I think everybody would be very supportive of that hmm. I have a plethora of ideas I'm ready to go Kara and go, we'll go for coffee after great thank you good really appreciate um, that yeah thank yeah you. really... you're not too far away <laughs> yes <Yeah. laughs> Really powerful. Thank you so much, guys. This is just um, it's it's just really meaningful to watch how we can move. You know, practical solutions are really important, um, and they can be small things, they can be big things. Um, you know, it can be reaching out, as you're saying, Doctor. I, you know, making sure you send that text to to your 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 Sudanese friend, making sure that organisations also support each other, and also I that there's a, yeah, and all, and also though the, those things like the medical supplies, everything on all levels um, that that we do that. I also just wanted to say, uh, if Fiona Quinn is still there. Um, I think just the same response as we've had from Kira from the HSC is hopefully with uh, with DFA there could also be maybe a reach out to uh, to Dr. Aya just to see what messaging could be going out on the DFA platforms. Nua, did you want to come in on that? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Nadine. Thank you so much, Aya, for for saying this and just echoing what Kira was said. Um, uh, I just uh, while we're talking about the HSC response, maybe we were interacting with the HSC on another level on the IMG program where the HSC were. Uh, for the IMG programs, international medical graduate doctors who come from Sudan for training for two years here. It was part of the HSE response for the ethical code of practice, kind of because of the 5% that uh, um, people, uh, so these people working in the HSE, so they kind of paying back for those countries by giving them the opportunity to come here for two years, uh, working, getting experience, going back, hopefully helping the the, the countries. So anyway, this is for a few years now, the program. Uh, I think maybe for the HSE, we really have to thank them uh, for what they did for us in the last few months, facilitating the visa 
for those who were kind of coming or for the scholarship, but they were stuck somewhere in some of the countries, their paperwork, whatever. Maybe as I said, maybe it was uh, on some scale for some pockets, it was kind of some good practices there, but not on the bigger scale, not on the HSE, not in all hospitals, but uh, just while we're talking about the HSE response, I would like to thank the HSE, the forum, yeah. and the and the, uh, the National Director for Training Program, the HSE, for what they did for the Spanish doctors who were in that program, right. sending them just an email, as I said, made a huge difference uh, and could made for, for all the Sudanis working, not only in the in the hospitals and universities yeah. and whatever. This really small act will make a huge difference. Yeah. Thank you, Noah. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I don't mean to Can I just I'll say one last thing? Is I think Noah's point is exactly right. Is that the HSE, as we know, is an institution that's really important in Ireland. All we do is talk about healthcare and weather in Ireland. We like we we do like our healthcare. <laughs> a, that is why I want to engage with the HSE. Yeah. Because I know that there are things that they can do that a lot of other institutions can't or won't do. Because Mm -hmm. HSE is an institution that cares about people, I think it's important that there are some really easy, tangible things that we can do that can really help, in my opinion, the mental health of the Sudanese doctors who are working and carrying the HSE in terms of lobbying embassies to help them get visas so they can go visit their families in Egypt. In terms of, like I said, I mean, lobbying the Department of Justice about this, you know, kind of a visa waiver program. Really, really simple things. All I, all we need is just some kind of extra face time and some coordination to make it happen. But the HSE can definitely do more in that sense and can also be thanked for all the good stuff that they've done. Two things can go hand in hand. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And I think this, the, 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 you know, the purpose of this webinar is to bring all these pieces together, to be able to see all of them, to be able to see what good is happening and what needs more to be done um, while the situation is still, um, is still ongoing. Um, Dr. Yasser, I might just come back to you because I know you have to, uh, you have to leave us. I do see uh, there's questions for you, specific questions in the chat about, you know, asking you in terms of, you know, training opportunities um, and, and just looking for different, but, but perhaps just in what you've heard so far, if you'd like to just give us a final remark and then I'll, I'll go to the next speakers thank you yeah, thank you very much uh, no it's just the last um, few points uh, one of them is the uh, MSF there was uh, Georgina Brown was it um, thanks very much because I know that... that was Sandra actually Georgina's coming next yeah. that was Sandra from goal yeah okay Sandra thank you. Um, so the, um, the the work is being done there outside Khartoum especially in my you know local area there in Kamleen and then the El Hasahisa and then Madani, uh, Shendi, the outer skirt of Khartoum and the near hospital of Khartoum is being tremendous work, to be honest. You know, I mean, the the, the facilities of brain and dialysis unit in El Kamdin uh, and the neonatal units and uh, the people there, I know them, they're very happy with it. And it's probably one of the only positives of this war is the decentralization of the services, especially. Uh, it used to be mainly in, in the capital of Khartoum. Um, and I just would like to say that uh, BFA, we had a meeting and I had myself a meeting with the Africa unit from the second week of this uh, war. And we had uh, so many kind of uh, requests from the um, uh, BFA. Um, one of them is diplomatic and political and other one is so I'm very thankful for the 8.5 million euro donation, um, though we think uh, a lot need to be added, uh, given that those were early days, you know, we didn't expect this war to to, to be uh, at five months now, and it could be even longer. Uh, and uh, the other issues were kind of evacuation to the Irish citizen, and then the doctors and the workers who were being caught during the first uh, few weeks there. Um, the visa to the uh, doctors to HSC as well as communication between us, the uh, BFA and uh, HSC, and successfully got everyone um, for the July intake. Um, so it, they were positive, but as I said, and uh, we all agreed that we needed to do more uh, from all of us uh, and the NGOs uh, in Ireland, as I said, MSF concern, I know they have a huge work there, um, uh, but we needed to, we needed to do more. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yasser. Thank you for joining us. And I see thanks coming through um, on the chat as well for all that you're giving back to your country. So um, thank you on behalf of um, of all of us and everybody that you are um, you are supporting. 
Um, I will go over to um, Georgina Brown uh, from MSF, Medicine Sans Frontier. And Georgina, I know that you are just returned from Sudan um, about two weeks ago. Um, so could you perhaps just describe the situation that, uh, you know, describe the medical and the humanitarian situation that you've just left behind? Georgina, you're muted if, uh, if you can hear me. We can't see you yet. Let's see if we can get you. Um, I see just while we're waiting for Georgina there, I see Eva Carr is just saying thank you for the webinar so far. Grateful to know how best to network with the speakers beyond this session. Um, I think uh, something we can think about in Irish Global Health Network, perhaps um, join the, the Irish Global Health, Health Network, um, our newsletter as a member, and then we can uh, continue to perhaps have an update from the uh, SDUI, the Sudanese doctors and 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 do that. Uh, Georgina has no sound, so she's going to rejoin. Um, in the meantime, I think I'll just go over to um, Dr. Elsa Dig. Perhaps I can ask you, um, so you're the president of the Sudanese Doctors in Ireland, and again, we're we're blessed to have, um, you know, two organisations supporting the, the many doctors working here in Ireland. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the role of the Sudanese doctors in Ireland, particularly in relation to, uh, to this conflict? Anything at all that you would like to add to the discussion so far? We, we'd love to hear your voice. Okay, thank you very much for uh, having me and... Uh for all uh, organizing all this uh, successful webinar. Uh, in the very beginning, I would like to thank the Irish government and the Irish people for their major support and help for the Sudan along the years, and especially the 8 million donation in the UN uh, Sudan appeared recently. Um, so most of the topics are covered by the speakers before me, but I would like, number one, to ask to, to thank the DFA for uh, sorting all the visas issue for evacuation. Uh, Minister of Justice, we had some communication with them regarding uh, visa and uh, permission to stay in Ireland for some people who doesn't have a job after July, for some families who are visiting the country and their permission to stay expired. And all these had an extension of permission to stay. Uh, the HSE, they did a great role and here in the Southeast actually, uh, including Waterford Hospital, Kilkenny, Coron Mill, and, uh, and uh, Wexford. Uh, they were very good to us, and we got a great help from the HSE. We did a fundraising in Waterford Hospital, and we collected more than $7,000. Uh, so all this is very good, to, to be honest. Uh, back to the Sudan, uh, the, the conflict is huge, and the disaster is huge, and... Uh, and people suffering everywhere, and mainly the Khartoum. And as the speakers mentioned, most of the hospitals are out of service. And in the major capital, only one hospital in, in Omdurman called Al Nau Hospital, which is uh, working at the moment. And the rest of the hospitals, unfortunately, Sudan went in towards 1955. And then 1972 up to 1983, there was a peace agreement. That's the only period where there was a peace. So during all this history of war, hospitals never been occupied only in this war where the militia of the Janjaweed, which is called rapid support forces, they occupied most of the hospitals in Khartoum, causing this major disaster. This never happened in the history of Sudan, the hospital being occupied by during military conflicts. Uh, so in, in terms of help, uh, from our side, we did ship, ship for uh, shipment for uh, uh, theater tables and uh, many other hostel equipments through our personal donation from Waterford, Limerick, and Colon Mill, and they been deployed to other places in the Sudan. As the speaker mentioned now, it's very difficult passing all these things through different parts of the Sudan because of the war. But we've been in touch with the Ministry of Health and we're still collecting some money to try to uh, help people back home, especially in other cities where the people uh, move to, like uh, Madani and Chandi and Adbara and Port Sudan. So in the meantime, we're liaising with our colleague in the UK, in Salamat, and the Gulf uh, uh, doctors, Sudanese doctors in the Gulf countries, 
in trying to help the situation in Sudan. So that's all actually we are doing at the moment, and we are happy to liaise with you as well. We are happy to provide staff even for doctors who are volunteering to go there if they get the, the right equipment and the right uh, support. And that's all we can add. Thank you very much. Mm. Thank you, Dr. Al Sadiq, and um, thanks for just you know bringing us out of. Sometimes we can be quite Dublin, Dublin focused, Dublin centric, just to show us what's going on in the rest of the country, and just to see that the network of Sudanese doctors is actually all around the country. And um, I wonder if um, if it's possible just to make some. You know, you said people could get in touch with you. Perhaps we could put your email address there so people could do that. And I see uh, Dr. Yasser has just posted that there's a Sudanese humanitarian effort um, organizing a fundraising dinner on Saturday, the sixteenth of. September, which will be in the Crown Plaza in Blanchestown, and all are invited. Um, so again, practical, just following Dr. Aya's comments as well, just being as practical um, as practical as possible. Um, I see a comment in from Rani. Um, can we think collectively on how to create a coalition of humanitarians to organize a, like a collective response, not just in Darfur, but also in other parts that are not directly affected by the war? Uh, that yet indirectly uh, by pressure imposed by the people uh, who have fled to safer places, um, especially medical services and especially mental health. Um, doc Dr. El Sadiq, just on a last comment, in terms of mental health, um, I think Dr. Aya's point was really important in terms of just the pressure on doctors here. Five percent of the of, of the of the HSC are Sudanese doctors, and um, is there anything specifically that you could you could you could come up with that, that we should be doing to support the mental health of those doctors as they support their families. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I agree with Aya. To be honest, from our side here, especially in the Southeast, we get a lot of support. We, we get approached by the HCC staff, by the medical manpower, and uh, they're getting good support, to be honest. And people are sympathizing very well with, with the whole Sudanese doctors here. I should move to the Southeast now. Awesome. Yes, it sounds like we have things to learn from the southeast, <laughs> Dr. Aya. <Yeah. laughs> um, I might come over to Georgina. I think your sound, uh, you're, you're back with us and your sound is, is back on. And um, again, just asking you if you can, you know, you're only back from Sudan two weeks. So if you could just describe the situation, what, what, what is the situation, particularly the medical humanitarian situation? Hi. Apologies for, for the lack of, uh, for losing me and the lack of sound. That's um, okay, we got you. I'm not sure whether it's the internet or whether it was just timed out after after one hour. Um, but thank you for, for inviting me and to all the speakers um, for, for describing the situation so well in Sudan. Um, yeah, I, I was there from the end of May and I returned, as you said, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and as everyone has described, the, the situation is, um, the, the health and humanitarian situation is, is dire. Um, and it's not just, I mean, like, as was described before, 65% of the hospitals are, are not functioning. Um, but the ones that are functioning are completely overwhelmed and they, they lack um, supplies, not just medicines, but also um, uh, logistical supplies. Um, Georgina, we just um, lost your, your video there. I wonder if you, you can bring your video back. Perfect, you you're back again? again. Yeah, thank okay. you. So yeah, it's not just medical supplies, but also like logistical supplies. So even, um, you know, a lack of bed for hospital beds for caring for patients. So, you know, you're seeing, um, particularly in, in Madani, where it was also described where the population now probably has increased to, to 4 million. The hospitals that are functioning are completely overwhelmed and you have two or three patients for, for one, one bed. So it's not just the, the lack of surgery and medical care, um, it's the prevention of infections as, as well. Um, and the lack of cleaners um, and the lack of safe disposal of, of clinical waste and, and sharks. So all these things um, you know, contribute to, to a very high mortality. So as well as having the war wounded, um, there's also a lack of access to obstetric care to, to, for women who need to deliver. There's also a lack of access to um, for people with chronic diseases, like for um, dialysis and for insulin. All these things are really uh, just unavailable. So yeah, you have an influx of, of of patients that are you know
disease, but you also have the people with the chronic diseases who um, can't get access to the medication that, that they need. Um, also with the lack of primary health care, um, the lack of vaccination for particularly for the under fives, you're seeing an increase in vaccine preventable diseases. So things like measles, um, uh, there's outbreaks um, pretty much everywhere now. Um, and also with the lack of um, water and, and poor sanitation, you'll start to see more, more outbreaks. Um, and things like acute watery diarrhea and, and cholera are also things that we, we need to be um, concerned about. Um, so, I mean, with MSF at the moment, we are five sections working in Sudan and we were working pre-conflict um, as obviously there were significant health needs before the 15th of April. Um, we're currently working in 11 states, providing uh, trauma care for war wounded, maternal pediatric care and treatment for malnutrition. Malnutrition is another, um, another thing which we're seeing increasing in, in pretty much all the states um, and there's a lack of capacity to, to respond for, for the children that are malnourished. Um, also regarding our staff, a lot of our staff are displaced um, and they also find it difficult to access the, the health care they need. So for example, staff that have, um, for example, there's one staff that has you know, a child with, with cancer, they can no longer get that care for, for their child. Um, so they need to go abroad to, to do this. So, I mean, it's despite MSF working, having five sections there and working in, in 11 states, um, there's so many unmet health needs and, and the humanitarian situation is just getting worse by the day. Um, and we're also finding it difficult to, to get supplies in, but also to get visas for international staff. So we, to expand our activities. So it's not just the areas where the active conflict is happening, but other areas where people are displaced and moving to, where there really needs to be more supplies coming in um, and, and getting to the people that need them. Yeah, thank you, Georgina. Um, you know, just such respect for, for MSF um, as, as we do for, uh, for Goal and Concern and other organizations on the ground. Um, what would you say, I mean, from your perspective and the perspective of MSF, what can people do? How should we respond? Um, what, what, what are some practical and, and perhaps there, you know, organizational responses that you would like to see? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the organizations that are there are, are obviously, you know, do, doing their best, but everyone has the same constraints. And one of them is that we can't get enough visas for international staff um, and also yeah, the lack of supply. So, for example, in Madani, which was mentioned before, in the hospitals there, we see there are a lot of medical doctors that have come from Khartoum. So they are there in these hospitals, but they, they lack the supplies and they lack, um, yeah not just medicines, but also logistical um, supplies. And then it's the support for, for what I would call the auxiliary staff, like, like the cleaners, like the laboratory technicians, um, you know, and, and the cooks, like to provide food for patients and caretakers. These kind of things, I think uh, other organizations could try and um, provide support. We do know there's a lot of volunteer organizations and MSF is also working with some of these groups as well. Um, because they are in areas which, which um, sometimes MSF cannot reach. So we are supporting some of these doctors groups to, to provide um, with some medicines and, and um, supplies so they can provide first aid care to, to some patients who can't access the facilities that we support. Um, so yeah, I, th I think it's, it's trying to find a way to get supplies in, but also to support maybe these volunteer groups who, who are on the ground and can provide you know, the food for, for patients that are admitted and, and for the caretakers. Um, and vaccination, especially the EPI for the under fives is another thing that we need to really um, increase awareness about, but also um, make it accessible. Um, so there are local staff um, who are doing the vaccination obviously before the conflict. Um, and yes, vaccines are in short supply, but there are still some vaccines in, in country. But it's providing the um, incentive to incentivize the staff so they can continue to provide the support. Because as was mentioned earlier, staff have not been paid for many months now. Um, so, so this is a big problem. 
Yeah, thank you, Georgina. Um, some very clear points. And I think there's, you know, there's quite a, a lot of people listening and will listen to this. And I think if each of us just listens and thinks about what 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 part we could play, how we could contribute um, in any of these areas, um, you know, we could just continue to contribute to the response. So thank you for that. Um, you know, I think we're as we come to the end of, of this particular um, event, it feels like there, there's a huge amount of work to um, to be done. And uh, somebody when somebody asked in the chat about how we could continue this conversation. And one of the things that we would like to do as the Irish Global Health Network is just set up a coordination page where you can reach the different people that you're seeing here in the webinar and the organizations that are involved so that if you are moved to um, to support or have a way to do that, you'll be able to um, you'll be able to find uh, the, those people and those organizations so we will we will do that um Nuha, i think uh, you know i'd like to hand back over to you um you know rather than than me to close this webinar i think i'd like to to hand back to you just to hear you know some final words um some final words from yourself and uh, and and just you know any words of anything that's appropriate in terms of a blessing for all of your family and and friends so back to you Noah. thank you so much uh, nadine and uh... I really, really uh, cannot emphasize enough on the, the appreciation of this session for us as a Sudanese where we felt uh, our voices are heard and uh, our concerns are raised and hopefully will be addressed. I think, uh, thank you so much for all the speakers who come here today from, uh, from the NGOs uh, who work in Sudan trying to help our people, for my colleagues, Sudanese people who are kind of hoping to uh, able to contribute back to our beloved countries and, and do something to um, improve the situation, the catastrophic situation in Sudan. Just while we are all working on this, hopefully we don't lose the hope. And this is the only thing that we hope all we kind of keep uh, wishing that we at one day in the next, hopefully near future, will be able to put back the smiles to our, in the faces of our families and friends from Sudan and the Irish friends as well. We'll do, Sandra, we'll do. And um, thank you so much. I would like to thank the Irish Global Health Network for this opportunity. Really, thank you uh, for all the efforts you are doing to help uh, the, the people uh, in Sudan and the Sudanese people in Ireland. Thank you all the, for all the team who helped in organizing this. Thank you so much for the Irish aid to uh, the direct and indirect contribution to the improving the situation in Sudan. Thank you for our colleagues in HSE, uh, for the Global Health uh, Department, for Kira and David, and for the, our colleagues in the, in the Irish Global, uh, the International um, Medical Graduate Forum who are helping us to, while we are working on this humanitarian uh, kind of situation, not forgetting the training of the doctors and still giving us a session, giving us opportunity in bringing more Sudanese doctors to Ireland next year as well. And hopefully all of them will be able to help back Sudan uh, as soon as they get a chance. So yeah, just um, thank you for all the people who contribute to this, for all the people who attend and listen, and for all the people who are helping us to find a better, uh, hopefully, future for the Sudanese people in Sudan. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nadine. Thank you, Nua. Thank you, everybody. Um, I know we'll all we leave here with uh, Sudan very much in our hearts and our minds. Um, so thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.